things moved in secret to the eastern seaboard. Rails and highways hung with endless eastbound processions of the military. Equipment, supplies, personnel. Carload by carload, trainload by trainload. It rolled unnoticed into the east. Nobody saw much of it. Nobody knew what was happening. It was a secret. And the secret was being kept. Even while American troops poured into the waiting transports in the harbors of the east, and docks and wharves overflowed with a stream of American goods of war, across the Atlantic, British factories were also jamming up rail lines and wharves of England with British tanks and guns. Vast preparations were underway, but in secrecy. The world didn't know it. The free press of the world was shouting with increasing clamor for a second front attack against Germany, while troops were pouring from training camps all over the United States and England into the ships in the Atlantic ports. American troops, British troops, Canadian troops, Australian troops, Norwegian, Belgian, Czech, free French. The men and materiel of the United Nations gathering for attack. But the soldiers and the officers of the soldiers didn't know where or when. It was a secret. And the secret was being kept. One by one, the bulging ships had crept in darkness from the harbors into the Atlantic, with sealed orders for a rendezvous with the rest of the convoy, such and such a latitude and longitude. And then, suddenly, altogether, ships, as far as the eye could carry, hundreds and hundreds of ships in convoy to an unknown destination. Freighter, transport, liner, trawler, carrier, battleship, destroyer, torpedo boat, cruiser, the greatest sea armada in naval history. Not one radio turned on. Nothing to give away the secret. It was being kept. Just two weeks after Pearl Harbor, in Washington, this vast strategy had been formulated. President Roosevelt had created the plan. Prime Minister Churchill heartily endorsed it. And together in the dark days of late 1941, the two Allied leaders discussed their strategy. To General George Marshall had gone the job of preparing the operations. And in England in April, he completed arrangements with Britain's Prime Minister. Dwight Eisenhower, now Lieutenant General, became commander of the new European theater. To General Mark Clark, the job of training U.S. troops in England. Ten untiring months after its formulation, the massive convoys nosed in silence toward their Gibraltar rendezvous. And yet, only a small handful of Allied officials knew what was coming. Scores of thousands of Allied troops en route to the attack, armed and supplied. And yet, a secret from the impatient world. The secret had been well kept. Aboard the packed transports, as troops organized in games to keep fit, they knew they were part of something big, some major action. That was obvious. There was suspense and anticipation. After several days on, began daily inspection of equipment and arms. No Saturday morning check over this. This is battle inspection. The men can sense it. And after months of training for it, they are ready. Eastward from America, moving silently to their rendezvous. Southward from England, 850 ships in synchronization more vast than any ever before attempted. Under an umbrella of protecting carrier-based aircraft, one part to the Mediterranean coast near Algiers and Oran, waiting for the moment of attack. One part remaining behind, off Casablanca, until along the whole North African coastline, the Allies can strike simultaneously. Fifteen sea miles off the key railroad city to the Moroccan interior lies the big task force of heavy U.S. naval units and packed transports. Carrier-based planes drone protectively overhead. And suddenly garrisons open fire. Orders to the United States Navy were to hold fire and fired upon. But now heavy gun turrets swung slowly toward Casablanca Harbor and left loose a roaring answer to Vichy. The attack has begun. The 
the unfinished Lombard, which was to have been the mightiest ship of France, lies smoking and in ruins from the uncanny precision of the 12-inch shells of U.S. battleships 12 miles offshore. Under orders from Vichy to resist, the French forces at Casablanca fought bravely, but without heart against their former allies. Too late to prevent serious loss, came orders to surrender.